It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Robert Toth, DMD, who earned a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Delaware and is DMD from Case Western University School of Dental Medicine. He is the owner of the Dangerous Dentist blog and podcast where he motivates dentists to be bold and live life on their terms. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Uh, thanks for coming on. I got to say a couple things. Uh, from from being in college nine years, you know, the the smartest of the smartest were math and physics majors. And if you couldn't do anything mathematics, you know, you were a communications major. And so I have total respect for any mind capable of understanding physics. I found that physics to be the most interesting thing ever. And because uh, math, applied math is physics, applied physics is chemistry, and applied chemistry is biology. And if you don't get the math applied to physics and applied to chemistry, then you, then no wonder you're an anti-vaxxer and believe in all these, you know, things. You just, you just don't know the f the fundamental science of how it works. So I big and congratulations on the on the podcast. Um, so how are you doing today? Thanks, Howard, for that introduction. But you know, really, the pleasure is all mine. I mean, you and your guests have been, you know, inspiring me. I I think uh, listeners get a lot of you know tremendous value out of this podcast because you know it just opens you up to the possibilities. I mean, when I hear success stories, you know, every day from your guests and just, and from you, you know, eventually I start to think, you know, that's something I can do. I mean, if this guy did it, why can't I? So I think, um, for a lot of, you know, young docs that are inspiring, you know, like myself, it's just, um, just listening to, you know, all the positivity and, and hearing success stories, you know, um, I feel like we already have kind of a leg up on our peers, you know, um, it, cause you know, it takes a lot of modesty to, um, to listen to another podcast. So just by listening to this, you know, it kind of separates you from those who think they know it all and those who, you know, are striving for self-improvement. So thank you. Now, do you have your podcast on, do you upload it to Dentaltown? I don't, I, I, I can do that though, for sure. Yeah, you really should because we got a quarter million people on Dentaltown and 65,000 download the app. And the whole reason I started a podcast, uh, I started a genre uh, on the Dentaltown app. And uh, there's about 60 people in dentistry putting a podcast on there. And everyone's told me that they, when they put their podcast on Dentaltown, that's when a lot of dentists see it. And then they go subscribe to it on, are you on your on iTunes? Are you also on YouTube? Uh, we're not on YouTube. No, I'm on iTunes, Stitcher and kind of the, the, the big ones there, but no, so, we are on so YouTube. So how come so you're I mean, handsome I mean, and you're not on YouTube and here I'm short, <laughs> fat and bald. And I'm on YouTube. You have a face for YouTube. I have a face for uh, iTunes. Uh, but yeah, it'll be the best, yeah. it'll be the best marketing thing you ever did. Put it on the dental town app because it's funny when I started doing dental town, um, this podcast, they said, well, dude, I have an hour commute to and from work. I need 10 shows a week. And I'm like, well, I can't do 10 shows a week. And it's right. what's amazing is they get in their car, they open up that dental town app, they start scrolling. What are they in the mood to for today? You know what I mean? And, uh, so I don't think in fear and scarcity, I think in hope, growth and abundance and anybody who's helping my dentist homies like you. I'm your biggest fan. So, so tell us about uh, your journey. You. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I graduated from Case Western, like you said, a couple of years ago, um, right out of school, you know, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I don't feel like we really were prepared very well. I mean, even from the basics of repaying loans to starting a practice or, you know, looking for a mentor or leadership positions and, um, you know, we just we weren't trained on any of that stuff. So I, I started out working for a private practice, which had uh, had five doctors in it, but it was just a single location. Um, I found that, you know, I wasn't being compensated very well and I actually ended up going over to a corporate job and I ended up making a little bit, you know, some more money there. And I do have quite a bit of autonomy. So, yeah, I went over to the dark side for the last year. Well, and, what was um, the company? What was, what was the DSO? It's a smaller group. It's called Ullery Dental and Orthodontics. You actually had a guest on your show. Um, they started um, X-Ray Upload. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know if you remember yeah, that. absolutely. Those two guys, they, yeah, they actually worked for, they only have five locations in Maryland, um, but he actually worked for the company, so I knew him personally. So when I, when I heard him on your show, I gave him a call right away. I said, man, one day I'm going to be on that. Right on. Um, so, so when you... When you uh, said you worked in a location and five dentists in one location, I always think it's, I hear the bizarrest things from dental students. Like I was sitting down um, some lunch in at a dental school and some guy, I said, well, what are your goals? And he goes, well, five years out of school, I want to have four locations. 
And I thought, that, that is a weird goal. I mean, because mm. are you talking about four locations with one dentist in each one? Wouldn't you rather just have one location with four dentists? I mean, you worked in a location that had five dentists in one. I, I, I could name you a hundred dental offices that do three to five million dollars in one location. I don't know why. You, you should try to grow your earnings, right. not grow your locations. It's like it's like in the dot com bubble era went from ninety four to March of two thousand, everybody's talking about clicks and, and clicks and clicks. It's like, well, you don't pay you can't buy coffee at Starbucks with clicks. What is your revenue? What is your net income? So you just want to grow earnings. So you're an associate for a right. small singular location of five dentists, then you went to a DSO, and then what? Well, right now we're actually uh, looking at a couple of properties um, in a small town uh, where my fiance lives. So I, you definitely got me turned on towards the small town and demographic searches. So we just found it, you know, it's her, it's her hometown, you know, her families are there. Uh, you know, I, I love her family a lot. They're, they're great. So we just decided that's, you know, where we want to open up shops. So right now we're looking at different locations, kind of playing with the idea of doing a startup, but you know, obviously it's a lot, or a, uh, I'm sorry, a, a ground up construction, but that tends to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, there's no lease really space out there. So it would have to be um, either buy a building and renovate it for dental or, you know, so we're, we're still, we haven't, you know, made any final decisions, but I am working with uh, Jamie Amos at Ideal Practices. So he's kind of, that their group's kind of helping us out a little bit. And, and let me ask you a question. I mean, you know, as far as owning a practice, I mean, I, this is something that unfortunately I didn't think about right out of school. I wish I had. You know, we know we're going to make greater income if we own our own practice. We'll have our own autonomy. We won't, you know, have to answer anybody. Um, and we know there's resources out there to help us build it. But why do you think so many people, and we've ran the numbers, why do you think there's so many people like me that, you know, we didn't come to our senses? You know, why are we weak? Why do we hesitate? Um, well, fear is a is a is something that's built into all the animals. I mean, I mean, my gosh, you don't want to eat some fruit you've never eaten before. It might be poisoning, kill you. I mean, fear is just. I mean, we, we wouldn't have evolved. I mean, it's Homo sapiens 2 million years old. I mean, we wouldn't have got to be where we're at today if we weren't afraid of stuff. I mean, we're, and, and also a lot of animals, they slowly evolved to the top like whales and sharks and wolves, but monkey humans, I mean, they, they were just a, a, an ape. And then all of a sudden they could think and they, they were never used to being the apex, you know, animal and they, they weren't ruling the jungle like lions and tigers. I mean, they were scared little apes. And then all of a sudden some mutation started. It seems like about 100,000 to 30,000 years ago and they started thinking. And so, yeah, it just built in. It's like your social need. Look, look how successful social media is because you you need to have, like you already mentioned your fiance three times. I mean, monkeys need social contacts if they don't have children they always get furry legged friends and cats and so fear's good and healthy it's just that is the fear going to shut you down or is the fear going to make you raise your game and i mean you're you're still a baby you're 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 still younger um yeah you're, you're the age of my oldest son i mean i always have to remind my son that he's a baby and so um you know success is a marathon not a sprint it takes a long time but it, it's amazing and and you're um you 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 saw demographics matter. You want to go to this small town. Your wife's there. There's nothing to rent. Obviously, there's nothing. There's no dental offices for sale. I guess. Correct. So so you're gonna build a ground up. I mean, I mean, it sounds sounds like you're you got you're not very fearful yeah. at all. I mean, you're going to a small town. You're gonna you know probably marry this girl if you build a dental office in the town. I mean, you're you're taking a lot of risks. You became a dentist. Uh, did you have a lot of student loans? Oh yeah, I mean I'm. Right now, I'm probably five hundred thousand in debt. So. Okay, so so you're not a very fearful yeah, guy. I mean, I mean, you you set out to be a doctor and did it. You crushed it. You're a dentist from Case Western. Um, you you committed a half a million. Look look at the default rates. All the student loans over a hundred thousand. There's no default problem at all. All the default rate with student right. loans is under twenty thousand because th those people never committed. Right. Uh, they they had one foot in yeah. in the water and one foot out. And uh, now you're buying land yeah. and building because you don't want to rent for 40 years and there's no substitutes in the marketplace. There's nothing to buy, nothing to yeah, lose. I mean, well, right. I mean, whether it's commitment, whether it's a lack of commitment or not, I mean, I think that a dental practice, I mean, I think they have a great track record. So, you know, I'm not really afraid of taking the money out of You've done the research. You know, like I said, we've ran the numbers. I, I, I know we're going to be successful. It's just I think that, you know, a lot of, I mean, corporate gro groups know this. I mean, if you're in a corporate group, I was just thinking about this today, you know, at, as a associate, like I'm making good money. I mean, 
it's it's not great you know i'm not really paying down my loans very quickly because i am you know kind of putting the money aside for my own side project but um but the the point i guess i'm trying to make is the amount that we're making is is good enough that i think it's easy to become complacent you know whether it's you know 30 percent or if you're making 150 or 175 maybe at a as an associate you know it's it's i think it's really easy to get stuck there for five years and then you know all of a sudden you look around and it's like oh well now i have kids now i have a family you know is it really worth the trouble now you know maybe i don't really want to you know passion kind of gets dried up and i think that that's not something that people really talk about but you know i think if you have a desire to start a practice i think you should probably act on it sooner rather than later because you just never know if you're going to have that passion you know in a couple of years well and also it's an age thing i mean like like uh sunday i was with you know five of my grandchildren i mean at 56 it just seems exhausting now when i was young and dumb I made four baby monkeys in 60 months. And while I opened up my practice, so when you're young, that's the time to dive in head first because you're, you're not gonna have that image. So what the, what the DSOs do, they pay you just enough to kill all your dreams and you get kind of comfortable for five or six or seven years. And now you turn over to your fiance, who's now your wife, who now had a kid and you say, oh, I'm gonna quit this comfortable job and take on all these risks. And she just shuts it down and says, no way. So yeah, when you're, there's no better right. time to start your own business and have your kids now. Do it before you can think and rationalize uh, how much <laughs> stress you're about to eat. Because just, just do it. I mean, you, you throw some kid in the swimming pool, he's not gonna drown. He's gonna learn how to swim. He's gonna learn, he's gonna survive. And the best time to do it is when you're you're young and got high energy and and are not aware of all the risk. Yeah, and and like you said, you know, um, I think setting those setting those goals, you know, just jumping in the swimming pool and and learning to swim. I think if you just kind of put yourself in that position, I think you know humans are you know capable of incredible things. I mean, obviously we've been through much worse. Whether it's you know a dentist in the 1800s uh, where you're using a you know treadle drill or you know you don't have proper anesthetic or you know even a dentist 60 years ago when you don't have four-handed dentistry you don't have reclining chairs I mean obviously we've been through a lot worse things have been a lot harder like you said with our monkey brains I mean we're capable of you know life and death situations and, and here we are you know worried about things that maybe are kind of trivial in my opinion so I, I think you know you you've definitely reached you know stratospheric levels of success you know something that i could only you know aspire to succeed one day um and aside from you know your incredible levels of levels of determination i know you work very hard you're you know constantly working you know constantly achieving um do you spend a lot of time thinking about your goals do you set big goals or do you think that plays a part in it i i do now when i was your and i don't mean to refer to you as a baby as an insult because i, I got four kids it's an affectionate term when i'm when i'm calling a 28 year old man a baby but i you know i um i tell them that when i was their age i was trying to accomplish all three or four of these things like next week or next month now by the time you get to be 40 you sit back and, and the best time to do it is between uh, um, Christmas and New Year's because basically the whole American economy shuts down. Your employees are all on vacation. There's nothing going on. And I sit there and I think, okay, this time next year, what would you like to, if you just knew you did this? And now in my 50s, that that's like maybe three things a year. But when I just focus my team of 50 on three things, I know we're gonna get and absorb and you know, these three things. It's kind of like Apple, like, like Apple will grow a year in what the entire McDonald's uh, entire organization does in a year, you know, that, 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 that's just the growth they'll have. So, so yeah, I, so, so I say less goals, um, more, um, more like, okay, this is, we can do this and just really clear, succinct goals. And every time I'm talking to those um, people and team members, you know, if I catch them for a minute, I'll go over those three goals and always talk talking about those things. But yeah. Mm. So that's kind of like, uh, I'm sure you've read, you know, Napoleon Hill's, you know, think and grow rich where you focus on those goals, you're focused on them every day. And, and for some reason, when you're just focusing on what you want, uh, it just kind of starts to come into fruition, would you say? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but again, you know, my book, People, Time, and Money, I mean, I, I, I love it because let me pull up this uh, uh, thing I uh, took, somebody texted me, but I called on Dental Town, so you can see I'm not full of it. I posted before the, the playoffs, I said, all the home teams are gonna win. There's seven and a half billion people on the planet Earth and only about 15 of them could ever take you to a Super Bowl. 
And sure enough, next weekend we have the Rams, we have the Saints, we have the Patriots and the Chiefs. And what do they all have in common? A phenomenal quarterback. So I'll tell you my darkest secrets right now. If you look at my success that you're you're talking about, um, well, my bit, my dental office is 31 years old, but all my management team, they're all 20 years old. So it took mm-hmm. 10 years of trying this office manager. And then you're like, you know, you trained her, you put a bunch of effort into her, but you know, it took a long time to realize, you know what? That office manager is not going to win the Super Bowl. We might have a nine and six right. season. We might be profitable, but we're not. I mean, we don't have... Um, a, uh, a Drew Brees from the Saints. We don't have, you know, uh, Peyton Manning. So, yeah. so it took me 10 years of going through people in HR and sorting people before I finally built a team that can take me to the playoffs. And, and then after that, you just got to manage your time and money. So you think having a pipeline like that as far as, I mean, especially for me, you know, going out starting a practice here this year, um, having a pipeline of new people coming in and, you know, maybe replacing some of the B players with A players and just kind of always having that, uh, always keeping the door open to new and better employees. Is is that something that you would oh, recommend? It's, oh my God. I, I, if I would have known what I'd known now, when I, in 1987, I owned my dental office, I mean, it'd, it'd be a, it'd be a 10 X difference as Grant Cardone always talks about 10 X. I mean, I mean, it's, it's just all the people look, 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 look at after the, the season was over, how many head coaches were fired the next day. And then you'll go into dental yep. offices and yep. you'll walk into dental office and the lady doesn't um, greet you. She doesn't maintain eye contact. She's just, you know, you answer the phone, um, you know, uh, green dental. And it's like, really, you don't have a, that's it? Green dental, you don't, you don't <laughs> have a name? Yeah, you, you didn't make me secrete dopamine. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the dentist's total acceptance of mediocrity is why you have so many NFL teams that will never ever be a contender uh, for, for, for the big game. And so, yeah, so it, it, it's tough. And that's why you can't get too close to your employees because I, you can't be my mm. friend. And I have to caution you, and I, I don't want to give marriage advice, but, you know, it, it's hard to fire a wife. It's hard to fire a friend. But, you know, when you're the head coach uh, for a sporting team, uh, it's really easy because everything you do is measurable. You threw this many interceptions, this many incomplete passes. You know, we won the game or we lost the game. But, yeah, just, just getting obsessed with HR is just Mm -hmm. everything i mean if if you got the right players on the bus i mean i mean it's like i'll decide we're in phoenix and we're going to la my team will decide are we going to fly take the train take a bus if we are going to take a bus who's going to drive and then the people on that bus if that bus breaks down halfway between phoenix and la i know the people on the bus will be able to change a tire call a tow truck have aa i mean and 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 you can really test your organization as if it survives your death i mean when ray Kroc died McDonald's didn't blink. When Sam Walton died, Walmart didn't blink. You know how many dental offices, if they drop dead tomorrow, their spouse would be like, I mean, the, the office, I mean, it just comes to a grinding halt. And that's called the Mack truck, mm-hmm. the Mack truck syndrome. By the way, when I went to MBA school, I bought my first laptop. It was in 98, 99. It was uh, two trimesters, uh, two courses a trimester, two years. And I bought a laptop and I went in there and I did the whole MDA, MBA program. And I took all notes applying to dentistry. And that was my 30 day dental MBA, which is free on YouTubes. It's free on iTunes. Uh, but that was another big game changer for me, really getting outside the office on Monday and Tuesday night, getting my MBA. Because the, without my MBA, I look at my uh, a dentist who's had an assistant for 20, 30 years. Well, she knows how to do a filling and a crown. And she, she, she's seen you. She's an apprentice. She could, if a civil war broke out and society collapsed, she could fix her neighbor's teeth. But does she, but is she really a dentist? And uh, I think getting my MBA at night school is great because you're starting this project. Um, you're moving to a town, you're starting construction. And then you, you, instead of, uh, every Monday night going bowling or Tuesday night watching Monday night football, you're going to waste, there's 168 hours in a week. You're going to waste a shitload of time anyway. But to sit in there with a group of 200 kids, two nights a week for four hours, one class six to eight, one class eight, 10 was really a, it was was like, um, you know, joining a priesthood or something. It was really getting out of your zone, disconnecting and focusing on the business. But yeah, it's all, it's all, it's just people, time and money. That's all it is. Yeah. I mean, whether it's the, you know, whether it's getting MBA in MBA or if it's just giving up the weekend thing. I mean, I think for me, I, you know, I had a great time in college and dental school and it wasn't really until a year ago that I just kind of decided to give up the whole weekend thing of, you know, going out, 
uh, you know, being hungover or whatever it be. And uh, it wasn't until I gave that up, like you said, whether you're whether you're disciplined, you know, going to class during the week or if you're going to give up, you know, kind of the weekend party life. I mean, it wasn't until I did that was when I really started to see big changes in my life. And um, I think another good thing you said there was, you know, if you're not growing, um, then you're shrinking, you know, and I think a lot of people get complacent, you know, with where they are because it's comfortable. And, you know, once we get complacent, you may not think that you're shrinking in a sense, but, you know, maybe your staff's getting a little bit older or, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, maybe losing their edge or you're just not growing. You're not, you're not getting better people in there. And then, you know, what are people going to say? Oh, well, I mean, that sounds great and all, but, you know, I don't have the time. I mean, I don't, is it really worth it, you know, to, to, to try and grow something that's already working maybe? Well, I would, I would, you know, you started off this podcast saying that, you know, success leaves clues. And so what I, I tell the graduates is that, you know, all the DSOs are going to come in the dental school and they're going to get all the attendance because they bring in free lunch, it's free pizzas. And so everybody's there for their free pizzas. And then they just speak fear and doom and gloom and scare the hell out of anybody that, you know, that uh, Howard's old and when he was little, all the pharmacists own their own business. Now all the pharmacists are employees at Walgreens and CVC and that's going to happen to dentistry even though the fact there's a big difference between 28 tabs of penicillin, which when I've been in Paris, France, I've seen prescriptions fill my own eyes where you, you leave your, your uh, doctor, it has a smart card, you put an ATM machine and a bottle comes down, a label comes on, tabs come coming out of hoppers and that machine is made in Scottsdale where they can't sell it in America because you know the, the government always gets together at Free Enterprise and helps them build a cartel uh, by pushing out all these laws. Oh no, you can't get 28 tabs of penicillin unless you go to the doctor and get a slip of permission and then come to the pharmacist. It's all, and then they wanna know why. And then after the government makes it so expensive that nobody can afford it, then their final solution is, oh, well let us just take over the entire industry. It's like, dude, if you weren't in the industry, everybody could afford it today, but you're 50 mm -hmm. years of screwing it up and regulating it and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but um. One, one thing I think is interesting um, with people, you know, maybe not having time, you know, let's say, Howard, you had a research paper in dental school, if you can think back that far. Um, you know, how long would it take if you, if you had two weeks to do it? How long would it take you You'd probably use the whole, you know, two weeks? But if you had two days to do it, it would probably get done in two days. And I think the same is true with time, you know, how much time you have in the day. And I think the same is true with money. You know, I, I just think that time and money tend to fill the containers that we allow them to. Um, so as far, you know, I, I never liked that argument. I don't have time. I don't have the money. I mean, everyone's saying that, especially new grads, you know, I, maybe they're not saying I don't have the time, but they're definitely saying I don't have the money. Well, I, I figured out my train of thought rise on is that, okay, so you go into these dental schools, okay. uh, the DSOs come preach all this fear and, and we're all supposed to end up like, um, um, the pharmacist, but I don't, but I don't think you can replace dentistry with an ATM machine like you can in France in pharmacy. But the bottom line is, um, um. If, it, if that's a true, if success leaves clues, then if you graduate from this dental school this year, you should be able to go to the principal's office and get a list of on an email of all the people who graduated three, four, five years ago, email them all and say, well, did you all leave and go to the DSO? And did you live happily ever after? Mm -hmm. Well, there's no freaking data for that. All the data I see no. is that, if, and I don't like to throw DSOs under a bridge because they live in an aquarium and I live in an aquarium. I, I get that feeling and it's it's not fair. Like if, if a private dentist has an infection control problem, it doesn't make the newspaper. But if a DSO with 500 locations does, you know, it's, it's in the New York Times. Uh, but nobody can keep associates because after you've gone to eight years of college, you're not the type of person that takes orders. You know who takes orders? An 18 year old grunt in the army, not a doctor of dental surgery or a doctor of jurisprudence or a medical physician, they, they don't do it. So, so every time I meet a graduate five years out of school as an associate, they've already had five jobs. So, so yeah. if, if you're in dental school, if it didn't work for any of the graduates over the last five years, it's not going to work for you. And right now you're young, you're dumb, you don't know everything that you're going to have to do to do this. So just pop out a kid and open your damn dental office. Your life will be really busy for a decade and then you'll be really rich with a kid that can talk and, and, and do things with you. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's tough uh, when, yeah. uh, you know, all the kid can do is uh, drink milk and poop. Uh, it's real fun. Yesterday when I got to watch all those playoff games with my four boys, um, 
So, so the bottom line is, um, when you're young, you just just got to dive in, and and I, I don't think you could be a doctor of dental surgery and not be ambitious. And sure, you have fear, but you know what? Smart people think about everything that can go wrong. There's a lot of dumb people right. that don't think about all those things, so they appear more fearless to you, or I'd say they're probably just dumb. Mm -hmm. So I, I think fear is a good emotion, and ride the wave and look for success. No one's working at DSOs for five years and saying this is this is why I went to eight years of college and graduated half a million dollars in debt. I don't hear that ever. I mean, I just don't hear it. No, and to your point, I mean, if you can get into dental school, you can get through dental school, you can pass boards, you can do all that. There's no reason why you can't start a dental practice but you know what i was told and and i don't know if i was necessarily told this directly but the general consensus is that you're you don't have enough clinical skills you don't know how to operate a business and um you're just not ready and it's really easy to to think that to be true but unfortunately you know even after being out for a couple years um there's still a lot that i mean i think six i think maybe maybe you want six months you know um you know, working for a, a DSO or a private practice just to get your, you know, just to get your hand skills up. But I mean, I still don't know a whole lot about business and running a business. I mean, I, I realized at some point or another, I'm just going to have to dive in and thinking that that's going to kind of come by osmosis in in two years of, of working. It's not. You might as well just go for it. I mean, I wish I would have. Yeah, and, and, the, and there, there's so many things a young person has. Like, we talk about the comfort zone. I mean, like, when I opened up my dental office, it, when, when you say this town, how many people live in the town you're thinking about going to? Roughly 13,000. Okay, 13,000. So someone might say, how, how many dentists are in that town, would you guess? A couple. One or two. But they're older. Just one or two in a town of 13,000? I would guess... They, they, yeah, they're, they usually usually there, there's yeah. half of America lives in 147 metros. The other half lives in 19,000 towns. Most of those small towns have a dentist for every 1,000 people. So if it's a town of 13,000, I would guess if I got on my smartphone and put dentist near me in the middle of the town, about 13 names come up because the draw is usually 2x of the town population. So the town population is 13,000. The draw is probably 26. There's probably 1,000. Right. There's probably 13 dentists. They're each getting about 2,000 people. The thing they forget <clears throat> is they're all old and lazy, so they all work Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5. When I opened up my dental office in Phoenix, my God, there was uh, a bunch of dentists on the corner Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5. But Friday, it was only, uh, we, we went down from like uh, 12 to 4. And then on Saturday, mm -hmm. It was just me and Mattern because Mattern uh, came from Creighton. He had four kids. I had four kids. We were hungry. But Saturdays, I mean, there was only two dentists in this town. And every toothache was a root canal buildup and crown for $2,000. And, well, about one in four would be an extraction. And three and four would have been a root canal buildup and crown. So when you get out and you make some mistakes and you say, oh, my overhead's too high or I shouldn't have bought that. Well, you're young. You can just crank out rock sand and water all day long every day and and sometimes i would um work a saturday and i go into seven and be there till seven and i mean you know it would just did huge sums of money and i was just earlier than that working parking cars at the hyatt regency or at a, you know i was basically minimum wage and i i, I just couldn't believe it but it, it, it's out there for those who work i see the same thing in san francisco where everybody says there's way too many dentists in San Francisco. It's crazy. Yeah, there's way too many Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, but there's not any dentists in San Francisco after uh, 7 p.m. any night of the week or Saturday and Sunday. Like in Phoenix, right. Arizona, if you fell off your bicycle on Sunday or on Christmas, the ambulance would be there, the police would be there, they'd take you to an emergency room and be fully staffed with doctors. So I hope you fall off your bike and break your leg. Because if you <laughs> fell off your bike and broke your front tooth off, you couldn't find a dentist in Phoenix on Christmas to fix that if you had a gun. I mean, literally. And then dentists it's, say, well, there's so yeah. much competition. You know? Yeah. And I th no, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, you know, most people don't want to don't want to work those types of hours. But um, but yeah, I mean, you could absolutely clean up. I mean, emergencies and same day treatment is is such a big part of dentistry. I mean, as everybody knows. So I think just cleaning up on emergencies and um, you know, people who work long hours, I think anyone can make a killing probably anywhere. But, um, yeah, I mean, in that small town, like you said, I mean, there's gotta be more dentists. I think there are a couple, but like her dad practices there and he, um, he hasn't taken on a new patient for, I think about a year and he works similar hours to what you were doing. He does like six days a week, sometimes 60 hours and a week. And he does not accept uh, new patients. 
and he and he hasn't taken a new and he cranks it out. I mean, there just there's too much dentistry there. You know, he should write. Tell him to write an article with Dental Time Magazine. You know how rare it is to find a dentist that won't take new patients. I mean, you know how rare that is. I, I don't, but it, it yeah. sounds. Well, it sounds well like he, he should write an article on yeah. it because what dentists do. Okay. It's the same thing with orthodontists. They're very upset about Invisalign. They're very upset about Smiles Direct Club because on, you know, the five rules of a business, is it faster, is it easier, higher quality, lower cost, is it more miniature? Uh, and uh, they want to uh, build their efficiencies. They want to get better marketing. They want to be on Instagram. They want to do every single thing possible, but they don't want to budge on that 6,500 bucks. And now you see Smiles Directs rolling out and saying, God, we'll do it for 2,500. And so, so one of the biggest things you have to decide at the fork of the road, are you going to be that, that all-star quarterback and do a low volume, high expensive, high fee where you're like the super dentist, like you're Drew Blitzo, you know, you're, you're Peyton Manning, or are you going to go for the other half of the American market, which you take my insurance, you're on my plans, and I just want it um, faster, cheaper, easier. So that, that's, that's a big strategic because both business models work in strides, but where it doesn't work is when you don't know what path you're on and they say, oh, I want to be uh, Drew Bledsoe or Peyton Manning, but I'm going to do it for all these PPO fees. So they start getting all this high tech equipment. They're going off to Coise and Spear and Ross Nash and Panky Institute and Dawson. And they got all the Mercedes Benz there is, but they're selling it for the price of a Chevy. And then you go in there and a lot of times those offices have, you know, labor that's 30%, 35% because they, they haven't, you know, GM has a Chevy, a Pontiac, an Olds, a, a, a Buick, a Cadillac. And, and these dentists come out and say, well, I'm just going to sell all those cars in one factory. And you're like, dude, I'm pretty sure that that doesn't work. I mean, you can't have the high overhead mm -hmm. for a Cadillac and then sell dentistry to Chevy. So one of the next things you'll have to figure out, you got your demographics, you got location. Hell, you're sitting in, up in town with a dentist that doesn't take new patients. And another thing I used to always do, 8% of emergency room visits are uh, odontogenic in origin. And I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, a specialist will send you cookies and all that stuff. I would drive around. Sometimes at night I wouldn't have anything to do. And we would drive around, me and the kids, and we would take cookies into the emergency runners with our pack say, hey, if it's a donogenic and you got a whole waiting room filled in there, I mean, why, why do you yeah. want to spend an hour triaging someone who has a toothache? And uh, same thing with pharmacists. My, my pharmacist, I would go in there and I would um, get them to enter my name, dentist first, because they're not going to remember Howard Fran. So I say, enter dentist, then put Howard Fran. And then here's my cell phone mm -hmm. number. And I can't tell you, they'll, they'll come in there and sometimes the pharmacist will FaceTime me and say, hey, can you talk to this lady? And I'm sitting there <laughs> and believe yeah. it or not, I mean, so so it's just about the hustle. I mean, if, if you're, you're- I love that. If you're yeah. if you're into the hustle and you're willing to work and you're in America, you're, you're gonna crush it, you know? So yeah, do you wanna love, be, love do you wanna that. be high volume, low price or do you wanna be low volume, high price? Have you thought about that? What? We've thought about it a bit, and I like how you kind of distinguish the two, you know, market segmentations there because I think DSOs get, you know, such a bad rap. But on the flip side, it's like who wants to take HMOs? You know, who who wants to hire these new dentists right out of school? You know, most private practices don't want to. I wouldn't want to either. Um, you know, not to you know, you know make DSOs look look better than maybe that they are, but I, I mean, it's really easy to. To vilify these these groups when no one wants to take HMOs because like you said there's two there's two markets here but um, back to you know what we want to do um, it's a good question I think that you know in a small town like that I mean I'm still gonna I mean I'm not from a small town so I don't really know you know how the logistics work but kind of my understanding is you know reputation is everything and um, you know I don't necessarily want to have you know a reputation of you know, maybe fees being a little bit too high and turning people down. And, um, but on the flip side, you know, we definitely have to be selective because otherwise we're just, you know, spinning our tires. So I think we're probably going to look for kind of a balance, uh, rather than just picking one market. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, I think we could crush as like fee for service just cause there's so much demand, but I'm not sure that, that, um, that would be best for us, you know? Well, and just, you also got to be true to yourself. Like, like I, I was born and raised in Kansas. All my parents are from, Parsons, Kansas. I, I I don't fit in in Beverly Hills, North Scottsdale. I mean, when I go to dental dentist parties in North Scottsdale, 
I don't even really like them. I mean, it's like some dentists, will, I remember some dentist said to me, I said, well, which, which one's the Peridons? And he said the one in the Birkenbach shoes or something. I'm like, you know the name of shoes? I mean, I, I'm in the wrong village. I, you know. so, so some people, it's like, how many people do you see that they go off to be a cosmetic dentist and they're short, fat, bald, they got brown teeth, they're crooked. I mean, everybody selling boob jobs and tummy tucks and cosmetic dentistry, they're all hot. You know, you could pull it off, you're hot, but if you're listening to this and you're not hot and you're from small town Oklahoma and you like good old folks, don't be a cosmetic dentist. I mean, you gotta be true to yourself. You know, and what, what type of people do you like being with? Some people like being with extroverts, some introverts, some rich, some poor. You know, I, I, um, you know I, I'll always be Kansas. I mean, I'm more, I'd be more happy talking to a homeless guy at a bus stop than I would a king or a queen. I mean, so if that's your passion, yeah. and I know a lot of dentists that are crushing it in the low end, and my favorite DSO is actually Aspen, because Aspen is the only one I see that has a target. I mean, a lot of these DSOs are roll-ups where they just get a bunch of money and they just start buying dental offices. And they don't have, these dental offices have nothing in common. They don't have a name, they don't have a um, software, systems, types of dentists. They're just rolling up offices and hope they can squeeze cost out of supplies and lab bills and all that kind of stuff. But Aspen, my God, they are a roll out. They go get money, they build their offices from the ground up. And where do they go? They go where they ain't. That's where you go, where they ain't. Democrats, they know that dentists like rich people, crowns, root canals, veneers, and they stay away from Medicaid and poor and dentures. And they go into the poor areas. They have a denture lab. Um, I have a, I can't say too many names because of HIPAA, but I have a very good friend. I've been treating for like 30 years and he never wanted implants ever. But I just saw him and he just got a, his dentury line. I said, oh, why, why didn't you come? I'm just curious, why didn't you come to today's dental? And he goes, well, dude, they just opened up an Aspen in Casa Grande and they had the lab in there and you had to send it to a lab. And I walked in there and I just sat out there with my wife and they did the whole reline and one stop. And I'm like crushing it. They, they're rolling out a name, a brand. They're, they're uh, advertising with NASCAR and they're getting that, they're, they're focused. And uh, that, that's where you do yeah. best when you're focused. I mean, look at Apple right now. They're, they're having a ton of troubles because they're starting to realize for the first time ever in their whole life that people just aren't gonna upgrade to a thousand dollar phone because the other one's a year or two old. And they're starting to look at yeah. the difference between Android and iPhone as they're starting to put cost in there and it's crushing Apple. Yeah, one thing I love about your mindset, Howard, is just a moment ago, you were talking about how you know, Aspen essentially, you know, maybe maybe stole a patient from you or, you know, and rather than seeing that competition and reacting emotionally, I noticed that you are actually saying, well, what are they doing right? What can I do? Is there something that we can do? I mean, they're crushing it. You know, can we maybe use some of their ideas or, you know, it's it's a totally different mindset. And I think part of the reason that a lot of people don't like DSOs and we talked about this earlier is just fear. I think it's a fear that they're going to take your income or take your patients. And um, because, you know, we we make decisions on things, like you said, based on emotion first. And I like that you don't, you know, that you that you don't let your emotions um, kind of dictate, you know, how you feel about, you know, other businesses. Well, you either think in fear and scarcity or you think in hope, growth and abundance. And I can tell you 30 years in Ahwatukee that when I got here and I ran across all the street to meet all my new classmates, you know, I thought they were going to be just like that. Yep. Half of them just like slammed the door in front of me and didn't want anything to do with me and lived in fear. And the other half were like, come on, have a beer. Let's watch a game. Well, 30 years later, which ones were much happier and richer and crushed it? The ones that, I mean, I have no problem giving the dental office down the street for me, my emergencies when I go out of town. I mean, I, just, I, I want what's best for the patient. And if you're always thinking, it's like when Arizona tried to build a dental school, the only person that opposed it was the Arizona State Dental Association. They tried to block it. And I said, well, look, dentistry was a profession going back to G.V. Black. Everybody in this room is going to die. All right? So so everybody in this room blocking in dental school, let's speed it all up. We're all dead. And there's no, what, dentistry dies when we die? I mean, it's just a stupid mindset. And competition's good. Yeah. I, and I saw it, and I told the orthodontist, I, I saw this in bleaching. Way back in the day, it was like 87, 88, this company Omni um, out of Arkansas comes out with bleaching. And it was brand new. And I remember calling Gordon, He they, there's no research on it. So I, we started doing it ourselves and all this kind of stuff. But we were getting 250 an arch. 
So we were making $500 a case. It was just like shooting fish in a barrel. Everyone was having fun. Everyone was loving it. And then Crest came along and said, 500 a mouth? We're get, we got this thing for 50 bucks. And it killed the business overnight. So the first thing we had to do is go from 250 an arch to 250 full mouth. And and the, the orthodontists are facing that now. I mean, what's good for the country? Immigration competition. What's really bad for the country is block out all immigration and let the government pass all these uh, restraining of free trade and the other countries can't export into your country. What you want is the most competition for labor ideas. And I, I think what it's the, one of the funniest things about America, you ask any American, well, what made America great? Oh, well, people migrated here from all over the world and the Italians brought pizza and the Irish brought liquor and everybody came here and built all this great. So, so you're like, okay, so you're pro-immigration? No, no, I'm totally against immigration. Yeah. Same, same thing with, <laughs> same thing, you, you, um, you know, they don't want Aspen to come in. Hell, they're worse than that. The S&P 500 goes to uh, Washington, D.C. and says, will you limit the import of this product so I can charge 20% more? Well, I mean, that's not going to solve yeah. anything in the long run. No, no doubt. I mean, there's no doubt that competition is good. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of the you look at the, you know, public, you know, USPS mail or, you know, any of the public services and uh, you see a lack of competition, you see a lack of competence. So there's no doubt that we need competition in business. And we as dentists need competition too to, to step up our game. Um, I think with the immigration thing, I think a lot of people, you know, at least for me, I, I'm I'm definitely cool with people coming in as long as, you know, they're maybe paying taxes or, you know, as far as the immigration argument with people, you know, coming to this country initially, I think the statistics are about 30% went back because they didn't make it. You know, there was no welfare system. Um, they just, they didn't have what it took. You know, they showed up, they were hoping things were going to be good. And for a lot of people that immigrated here, um, when we started this country, they, you know, packed up their bags and went home because the reality was they didn't have the goods. And I think that resilience is what makes this country so strong. And, you know, I don't think you can have it both ways. I don't think you can have a well, a welfare system and have open borders. Um, I think you got to kind of pick one or the other. And I mean, I'm, you know, as long as people are paying in taxes, I had no problem with competition. I think it's good. That's a brilliant mind. Yeah. Because that's what Milton Friedman said about it. You can't have open borders with a welfare system. Once you start telling people they don't have to go pick uh, strawberries for $10 an hour in the Arizona desert and they can just get welfare, well, guess what? It doesn't work. Um, you you mentioned at the beginning of the show that you um, were a big fan of Jamie Amos. He's got two websites, how to open a, de how to open a dental office and idealpractices.com. So tell us your journey. Are you using a, um, Jamie now? Yeah, we're using him now. And uh, his team's been great. I mean, they... They they're always following up with us and you know because right now we're kind of you know at a standstill we're kind of stuck in park right now just looking for the the right building but you know he's a, they're always staying in touch with us and um, very positive just just good energy just a good guy I mean um, you know looking back um, could I have done it on my own you know maybe but it really gave me the confidence that I needed to take those steps so for me that's worth the the price of admission right there. But, but, you know, as we move along this process, I think they're going to prove more and more valuable. And how, what, what is the fee? Is it just like lectures, tapes, is it a consulting fee? How, how does the money side work? Well, we, we put down a, a down payment, um, in the beginning and then there's kind of more as it goes. I mean, we're with the high end cons consulting, um, you know, program. So, you know, we, we pretty much have, you know, we're talking with Jamie, we're, they have a team of, I think, 13 different people, and, and each one is very specialized as far as negotiating with the bank, negotiating um, a lease, um, you know, supplies, uh, con you know, construction, you know, everything. They have basically special, you know, specialists in each in each category. So, um, yeah, I mean, all the tools are there. It's funny because I've been one of the, one of the mantras I've been saying about forever and ever and ever and just repeating myself till I can't even stand to listen to my own self is that dentists always want to invest all their money in um you know a, a hundred fifty thousand dollar CAD cam, one hundred thirty thousand dollar laser, one hundred thousand dollar CBCT, and I always tell them the number one return on investment will always be a dental consultant. 
That's the number one. You give them a dollar, and in that calendar year, in your statement of cash flow, you'll get that dollar back, and you'll get more. I mean, success leaves clues. You bring in someone like Sandy Pardue or so many of uh, these consultants I've had on the show, and they can just fix the problem. And if you don't, and if you're in Oklahoma and you say, "Well, I want um, someone from Oklahoma," I think well, that's even better. And I've podcasted, I've passed podcasted consultants from. 20, 30 different states. And and like like Wisconsin is very yeah. different than Michigan. It's incredibly different than Michigan. And uh, so so getting guidance of someone who can say, hey, don't stick your tongue in that light sock. You're, you're not gonna like it at all. Um, you know, and, and pulling you in the right yeah. trap, it's, it's awesome. I've got, yeah, I've actually got a notebook in my car and I started listening, you know, when I first graduated dental school two years ago is really when I started listening to you. And uh, I probably have, I'm not exaggerating, probably 50 or 60 guys and girls names written down like this consultant's great for this. This consultant's great for that. I mean, I'm so ready to to hire who I need to hire. But your show has given me so much value in that. I mean, there's just you got you've interviewed so many consultants and they all they've all I mean, sound incredible. So I can't wait to to go go back to that list and and start making some phone calls once we get set up. Yeah, and some some of it's you, you got to be true to yourself because, like, I say some of you um, want to be a high end cosmetic dentist. You're hot and you're in Beverly Hills. Uh, I don't recommend being a cosmetic dentist in Parsons, Kansas. Um, it just you know that just is what it is. And then you got to find out do you have any passion for something like because like say you want to get into implants. I mean, just to learn how to place implants and bone graft and I mean that is a full symphony that will take you 10 years to master and mm -hmm. then you want to so so one of the problems I see with the young kids is like they're they're off learning Invisalign they're going to learn endo they're going to learn silver diamine fluoride they're going to learn occlusion they're going to place implants they're going to be bone grafting and I just sit there and say dude I, I don't know anybody like if you're really a hot implantologist and and you do like two million a year placing implants well you don't do any molar endo you know you don't right. do invisalign you know the, you can't be everything yeah you can't be everything right. so so and, and and as far as the business you know uh, um again like the conductor i mean um what dentists do wrong is they they they, they join a symphony and they play the piano and they're like oh i like I like the violin, so now I'm gonna start practicing violin four hours a day. Then I say, oh, and I like that tuba, and I like the, and next thing you know, they're trying to learn 25 instruments, but the rich people are the conductors saying, well, I'm not gonna to learn to play the violin. Wouldn't it be easier just to find the most rocking hot violinist in Phoenix and join them my team? Yep. And the ones that build a, and then and then when they build that, I mean, that that's true leverage. I mean, I'd rather have yeah, a periodontist, I'd rather have a periodontist come in my practice and place implants and share the revenue 50%, they go learn it and do it all by myself. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's the sign of a good leader is knowing what your talents are or what your passion is, um, you know, getting really good at that. And then, you know, figuring out what your weaknesses are and finding the right people to fill those gaps in, you know, whatever your weaknesses are. I mean, it makes sense to me as far as, you know, an efficiency standpoint. Yeah, and you take something just like sleep medicine. I mean, sleep medicine. I mean, I've been taking courses on that for years and years and years. I mean, even that. I mean, there, there's people that only do sleep medicine and dentistry, and they barely are on top of that game. And then to sit there and then to throw yeah. implants on the side, are you out of your mind? I mean, it'd just be a lot easier yeah. to take the time and to, to go. What, what's the biggest city you're close to? Uh, Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, I would rather spend all my Fridays looking for the best sleep apnea guy in Baltimore to come to my practice one day a week and the best periodontist mm -hmm. to come in and place my implants for 50-50 and, and on and on and on. I mean, that that's just a hell of a lot easier than to running to every finishing school known to man and trying to be a jack of all trades. I mean, I did it because I loved it. It was a passion. I mean, I loved root canals. I loved, I loved all that stuff. But there's a difference between loving something and making money like you might love coffee right. but it doesn't pay your bills it's just you love your dog <laughs> uh, and you don't know why i mean i uh, my cat I'm, I'm a cat person and i i still can't believe how much i love cats because the only reason my cat doesn't murder me and eat me is because i'm too big uh so you you can right. you can love <laughs> to take these courses and do it but then you got to separate the emotion which what is the best business decision? so talk about your podcast sure so how, how do they um, find it yeah, so we're on, you know, Stitcher. We're on, you know, uh, just the standard podcast app on your on your iPhone. Uh, you can just type in Dangerous Dentist or, 
you know, Dangerous Dennis podcast. And it's just Brian and I, you know, we, we're just trying to figure things out ourselves. We talk a lot about mindset, you know, being positive um, through different techniques, whether, you know, it's and lifestyle, who's Brian? cutting back on. So Brian Gallagher, he graduated um, with me at Case. So he, he works with his dad in Cleveland. So, you know, we're able to do it remotely, obviously. And um, but he's just he's a great guy. He's very well spoken, very insightful, um, just a brilliant guy, just a stud. You know, he, he ran track in college um, at at Ohio State. So, you know, he's a and stud. What, what he's a good city, guy. What city does he practice in? He practices in Cleveland in with Cleveland, his dad, with his dad. And you got and how often do you guys put a show out? We do one a week right now. Yeah, and, and uh, what we do is, you know, some weeks it's just him and I, and then other weeks we bring on basically guys that we graduated with or guys we knew from school. I mean, we've we've brought on probably four or five people now. Uh, we just had someone on today, actually, um, who's been working with a corporate group for two years. Um, he just decided to switch, but he gives his, you know, what it's like inside a corporate group. So if you're new, if you're graduating soon, or if you just want to know more about it, I mean, he'll tell you what it's really like. Is his, you know, da- it's not, is his dad Michael this Gallagher? Um, I'm not sure. Is it Sorry. West Park Dental, Michael Gallagher, DDS, yes. and Brian D. Gallagher? Yes. Right That's on. correct. Yeah, and, and, then, and then your homies got to love it. I, I'm sure kids in dental school and just graduated in the last year or two love the fact that you guys are young and fresh and are just doing it. Um, um, are, you, are you having fun with the show? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a blast. I mean, it's just it's fun to talk about this stuff because, you know, us as dentists, I mean, we love to talk about the clinical side of dentistry, which is interesting, but we all have struggles. We all, you know, face, you know, maybe periods of depression or just difficult, you know, just difficult times. I mean, stressful times, anxious times. And it's just it's nice to have someone to talk to and bring on guests and, you know, just sharing techniques that have worked for us and, you know, just building, you know, towards growth, you know, really just a growth mindset. That is awesome. So you do one show a week, and uh, but yeah, man, upload all those in the RRS feed on Dental Town, and just consider free marketing because people they sit in there, and sometimes they, they yeah, tell absolutely. me they're looking at setting up a practice. Sometimes they're just scrolling because uh, they're going to work, and there there's something they're afraid of, like a molar root canal. So they want to listen to an endodontist on the way in, or or maybe they only place uh, one implant a month. That's that's another thing I always talk about that. Um, I, I've seen no evidence of success if you don't do the procedure once a week. If you, if you, When they do fillings mm-hmm. and crowns, a couple of each every day, they get really good, fast, and profitable. But when they learn sleep apnea and they do one case a month or Invisalign one case a month or place one implant a month, it's always a black hole of energy and resources and time. And I mean, you, you can see an orthodontist office, they, they flip patients every 15 minutes and then some dentist is doing Invisalign and he schedules, you know, hour long checks. It's like hour long checks. What are you getting 25 yeah. grand for this case? I mean, uh, you know, um, you know. Do you do Invisalign yourself, Howard? Uh, yeah, well, I was always, an, uh, I've always had associates. So uh, I've always had associates that did uh-huh. Invisalign. And, and that's the other thing when you get a group practice, like we have one guy that likes to do sleep. We have one guy that likes to do Invisalign. One guy that likes to place implants. And uh, I like to eat in the break room. That's my, uh, that's <laughs> Someone's my, got it. That's Someone my, has to do the heavy lifting. Yeah, that's my specialty. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, nice. um, so you, it's every week, your podcast, and it's on um, yep. I, iTunes. Are, now, do most people yep. go to dangerousdentist.com and listen to it off your yeah. website, or do most people go to iTunes? Yeah, I don't have the stats on that. I kind of cheaped out when I was, I mean, I, I created my website, you know, on my own and, uh, and, and blog, so... You know, I when I first started it up, I didn't get the statistics on that, but I know for a fact that a lot of people just listen to it straight on the site. So, uh, but also I put out a weekly post um, every week. You know, just just talking, like I said, mostly mindset stuff. You know, like you know, you can't always control what happens in the day, but you can control how you feel about it, and um, you know what you bring in in the office, and and just different lifestyle stuff that you know relates to being a dentist. So put out you know a weekly article, we put out a weekly podcast, and you can subscribe just on dangerousdentist.com, and you'll get you know just you won't get any spam you'll just get an email reminder when there's a new post or a new podcast so it's pretty easy so you and brian both went to the same school yep and, and what what percent of your so you've been out two years right yeah that's and, right and, and what well, so, two and a half years okay yeah. so what are your what are your homies doing are, are they happy are they glad they did it are they sad are they stressed um you know i think a lot of i think a lot of people are stressed i don't think it it's the life that we expected you know we kind of thought we were going to be diving into a money pit like scrooge mcduck but uh it didn't really pan out that way and to be honest 
maybe one or two people in my class own a practice. I mean, it's it's small. I, I like I said, I know for a fact that there's one. There might be two. But you're looking at a class of 70 plus people and we're two and a half years out. So um, there's a serious trend towards just being an associate. And um, so I, I definitely think that, you know, there's a lot going on. So there are only 70 in your class of Case Western? That's right. Yep. And and only two of them own a dental school, a dental office two years out. So yeah, there's uh, there's a couple guys that are you know work maybe partners with their you know parents, but how many yeah. how many of them um, are are stressed? And this is not really what they signed up for. Of that, of that remaining sixty eight, how many do you think? What percent? What would you guess? I I would say a hundred percent. I think yeah. pretty much everybody. I don't know. I, it's tough. And, and, maybe not a hundred, maybe 80, 80, 90 percent. And do you see them having a long term plan that they eventually want to open their own, or do you not? I mean, do they, are they now that they're unhappy two years out, do you see them getting a plan and what or not really? I think so. And what is their plan? Yeah, I think so. I well, the guys, some of the people I've talked to, I always ask them that because I'm always curious, and I think a lot of them say that's their plan, you know, in the next year or two. Um, and I, and I believe them too, but. So I think a lot of people are moving towards that. I think not everybody, but I don't know. It's a touchy, it can be a touchy subject because then you're really asking people to, you know, consider their life choices and that can make them uncomfortable. So I, you know, try not to pry too, too much, but. And, and so much yeah. of the stuff they, they don't want to talk about. Like, I, I love it when anybody in dentistry starts about financial planning, they talk about every single thing except financial planning. You know, they're always talking about you know, all this crap. And it's like, look, the basis of financial planning are if you don't get married, you won't get divorced. Every time you get divorced, you lose half everything. So, so let's get rich. Let's not get married. And then kids, kids are the most expensive thing in the world, but you'll never hear a financial planner say, don't get married. If you do start living with a girl, do not sign a legal contract and don't have any kids. There's already 8 billion people on the planet. And then, uh, and then what do you find out, you know, 30, 40 years later that the dentist got divorced, the ones that had four kids versus two or whatever. Um, so a lot, a lot of this is just lifestyle. And, uh, so what do the millennial, so are you considered a millennial? I think so. Yeah. Well, how old were you in the year 2000? That's the definition. You were coming to age. Oh, in the year I 2000. was 10. Oh, you're 10. So you're, I was 10. So you're really not a baby. I think, I think a millennial is someone who, uh, kind of had their car keys. They were 16. They were working at McDonald's. You know, the year 2000, you were coming of age. But I, what comes after right. millennials? Is that Generation Z or what's what's next? I forget if it's X or Z. It might be. Z sounds right. Yeah, but, and uh, there's no I'm science not sure. behind any but, of it. But, but you know, what, that what, genera- I'm really worried about that generation. And, and what what does your generation not like about my generation, the baby boomers? I mean, when you're a young dentist out there and you're, you're um, going through your journey, what do you look up at the older people like me and say, good job? And what do you look at and say, bad job? Um, I think what I look at is, I mean, I say good job because, you know, pretty much what, from my understanding is your generation, you know, just went out of school and, and went for it. And, um, they, you know, you weren't bogged down on social media and spending hours watching TV and, um, partying and looking at Instagram and, you know, you were just getting out there and, and, and working. Um, you know, we live in a different time now where unfortunately it's a lot of, you know, participation trophies and, and, you know, it, it's just a lot of babying and, and, um, you know, and not only, and not only that, but, and then, you know, the other side of it too, is I think your generation had it a little bit easier in the sense of, uh, fees were maybe a little bit higher. I think, you know, t- to succeed nowadays, I think you really need to have all your ducks in a row. I mean, I don't think you can just go out and open a practice and just hope that you're going to make money. I think you really need to do your research and, um, you know, we're, we're not really expected to for the, cost of fillings aren't really expected to go up in the next 10, 15 years. You know, um, you really, I think efficiency and, and having the right systems in place is more important now than it's ever been. So, but I think sometimes the boomers don't, don't necessarily see that. They are like, Oh, it worked for me. And I was successful, you know, you know, maybe in the eighties and nineties. And, but now, uh, I don't think a lot of them realize that, um, we have to work a little bit harder to, you know, just getting out of debt. I mean, just look at the student loans. I mean, it's, it's not even, it's not, close to you know inflation doesn't even so so but but, so back to financial planning you know um if you don't you know um bill maher says it all the time you'll say well how did you have enough money to give that 
congressman a million dollars for his campaign. He goes, because I've never been married. I never had a kid. Boom. Um, another thing, they come out of school. I, I watch them in these two dental schools here, and they come out, and they're $400,000 in debt because these private schools are $100,000 a year. And I know their dad. Their dad's a dentist. I say, you need to go back home and live free with your dad and walk to work and just you know, put away. I don't want to live with my dad. And the next thing you hear, they don't, they're they they're an associate <laughs> and they went and bought a yep. $350,000 house and an $80,000 yeah. BMW. And you said, how did you get $80,000 for a BMW? Oh, I leased it. And you're like, oh my God. So living below, you yeah. know, it doesn't matter what you earn. It's what you burn. And, um, um, but as far as the- That's the a ba- big problem. Yeah. Yeah. So the baby- That's boomers, a big problem. I, I say the baby boomer dentist did our job if your mom cried when you graduated from dental school. I mean, when, you know, when we, when we leave a profession so right. much that your mom's crying at your graduation, you know, we, we, we did our good job and, uh, your, your, your generation is going to do fine because the people are, uh, the country's getting richer, they're having less kids and there's simply more money, uh, for whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. I mean, you know, you go back to world war II. one of the, the number one rejection for a grunt to join the army, uh, was he didn't have seven teeth. I mean, you know, that's just not an issue today. I mean, can you imagine that you're trying to fight the Nazis and Imperial Japan in World War II and you can't go fight because you don't have seven teeth in your head? I mean, you know, yeah, times right. have changed. And uh, so I, I think dentistry is going to do good. Um, I love the names of your podcast. Um, how to use meditation for a painless injection. Five easy steps to treatment plan presentation. Is selling dentistry immoral? Are you are your dental assistants driving you crazy? I love I love your shows, and you have them on um, communication, corporate dentistry, dental assistants, dental economics, extractions, leadership, lifestyle, meditation, mindset, money, motivation, practice ownership. I'm so damn proud of you. Uh, I know you're gonna crush. I can I can always smell success. I mean you you're 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 already thinking about it. You're already talking about it. You got to drive. It just you just need some time, and you're gonna crush it. Thanks, Howard. That means a lot coming from you. Well, it'll happen. Hey, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, let me know if they're at Howard at Dentaltown.com. There's anything I can do for you or help you or whatever. Just uh, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your journey. And good luck with the Dangerous Dentist podcast. Thanks, Howard. It was a pleasure. 